I just want to say the year's not over, Stefan, so I have some Christmas gifts for you, but we'll talk about that later. So, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about, you know, the fundamentals of uh, deep learning. Uh, so I'm a visual person, so uh, here's a little bit of depiction of where I'm from. I was born in Haiti. Uh, as Stefan mentioned, I did my studies in Montreal, and now I'm in Facebook. And now I moved... Uh, took the plane to come speak to you today. Uh, so this is one of, our, uh, one of my work on translation. And this year, we also did some work uh, on agents that can negotiate with humans. So you might have heard about that as well. So this is the structure of the talk. Um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction. Actually, you could even call that an abstract. Uh, I'm going to talk about the history of deep learning. And the point is not just to you know, bore you with some dates and names of people that don't matter anymore. It's mostly to take you step by step so you can understand how we got to this point and, the, and, and basically make you go through the process of discovery of why these ideas were good. Uh, we're going to talk about modern deep networks. So I'm going to, so, so over the 40 year, 40 year or so history of deep learning, there's been a lot of back and forth about this is the best activation. No, this is the best activation. I'm going to condense that down and uh, give it some focus so that it's uh, streamlined and easy to understand. We're going to talk about modern techniques and tricks for training deep networks, which are ever more important. And we're going to finish, if there's time, with some application. So this is basically my recommendation on what the structure should be. but. Uh, the point here is more to have something interactive. So if at any time you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt, and I can maybe dig in into specific aspects. So this is the introduction. Um, deep learning is a class of machine learning methods that aim to learn year keys of features. And the job of each of the layers in that year key is to make the job easier for the next layer. And contrary to what you may have heard, deep learning is not a silver bullet. It's really just a tool among many other tools that you can use in our quest for AI. So the rest of this talk will basically be trying to unpack those, basically, those three bullet points. So let's start out with the history. Um, there's, much like in this room, there's many, many backgrounds. Deep learning is also the combination of many, many fields, of results of many fields. But uh, in, the in, just, in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on some of the work that was most influential. So uh, the commonly agreed start of uh, deep learning or connectionism, I would place it at uh, summer of 1958 with this paper that was in uh, Research Trends. And that paper was so special that the editor uh, added this note saying that because of the unusual significance of Dr. Rosenblatt's article, uh, the whole issue is devoted to that single article. And uh, fittingly, the title of that article was uh, huge. Introducing the perception on a machine which senses, recognizes, remembers and responds like the human mind. So spoiler alert, maybe they overclaimed, overstated the case <laughs> just a little bit. But you have to understand they were very, very excited because um, they had finally found a way to get some inkling of what's happening inside of brains. And brains are monumentally complicated uh, achievements of nature. Even when you look at very small animals like the capybara, uh, you may know it. It's a very cute animal, uh, friendly with everyone. That very small animal has one billion neurons, right? Very very small brain, but many many cells, and each of them crucial to bringing the behaviors of the animal. And at, at the top of the of the totem, you have the human brain, which has 86 billion neurons. So providing a framework that can explain what is going on within 86 billion neurons uh, should seem like something that is impossible, right? 
But when they put the brain under a microscope, what they found is a very regular pattern. They found that each of the cells was connected to other cells. Uh, and this is what, what you see here in three uh, formats. One of them is a microscope, two types of microscopes on the left. And here you have a, an, art, an artistic rendition. And they found that, strangely, uh, even though th this is a biological system, the, the different neurons would communicate with electrical impulses. And that kind of reminded them of another system, which was having its A day, which is digital systems. And that brought forward the idea that maybe the brain is just a, the combination of very, very simple elements put together in a very, uh, to, in, in a very orderly fashion to create complex behavior. And so it's from that perspective that they actually managed to produce a model of neurons. And that model is called the perceptron. So let's talk about it a little bit. Um, the perceptron is simply trying to replicate what a single neuron in biological brain is doing. And what they found was the following. If they put uh, voltmeters in the inputs of a neuron, and they looked at how the, the signal coming out from the neuron would behave, they found that it was basically taking the sum of the input signals, right? So uh, x1, x2, xn are different neurons. And basically what the, the neuron is doing is just summing the signals with, with some kind of weight added to the signals from uh, different neurons, and then doing what we call a step function, which is looking at whether that sum is positive or negative, and then deciding based on that whether to fire or not. So when it's negative, you don't fire. When it's positive, you fire. And another way to write this equation, uh, to, to write this diagram here, is uh, using this equation, which is basically saying that um, the sum is equal to W0, which you can call a bias, plus uh, weight number one times the value of the input neuron plus et cetera, et cetera. And if you recall basic, your basic geometry, this actually is really just the formula for a line, right? So if you're moving around x1, uh, w0 will decide the intercept, and w1 will decide the slope of that line. So that seems like a really, like, uh, really basic, right? But they realize that, no, actually, this, this can be somewhat powerful. Because if you have the neurons represent something somewhat in interesting, so let's say one of the neurons was uh, representing the level of domestication, and then the other neuron was representing let's say, the size of something. And if you placed points, so here for, for the cat, you measure how much is domesticated, how, much, how, how big it is, and you place it on this map. What the perceptron is allowing you to do is just putting a line between two classes, right? And so in this fashion, you can discover patterns in your data. Here, the pattern you discover is that, well, uh, cats are less domesticated and are smaller. Also not said is that cats aren't as good as dogs, but that, that's my opinion. <laughs> um, so these were the lasting insights from the perceptron. The first one was that you want to use numbers to represent everything, right? Y usually when you think about intelligence, you're thinking about a program. You're thinking, well, I'll have to be clever and put an if here, and I'm going to use a, a sort, etc." The perceptron is basically throwing away all that and just saying, let's just be stupid. We don't know anything. Everything will be a line, and we'll just uh, adjust the slope of that line. Second, you want to use a simple rule to decide whether something is true or false. And third, you want to learn by adjusting the numbers. So remember, the only knowledge that is in the system is the slope of that line, how that line falls. And that is something that we can adjust very easily numerically, because everything in that system is numbers. So all was well for probably like five years. Funding was coming in from DARPA. They're like, whoa, like, w what can we make with this? And Rosenblatt was telling them, well, we can, we can do everything. We, we have solved AI. That is until 
other people started hearing what he was saying. And one of these people was uh, someone very influential in AI called Marvin Minsky. And after many, many heated debates with Rosenblatt, uh, I guess uh, Rosenblatt made one claim too many, and in 1969, Minsky and Papert proved that the perception cannot even solve uh, the XOR function. So this was a major blow, because if you recall the title of Rosenblatt's paper, it was all about how you know, it can remember, it can feel, and now it cannot learn a simple Boolean function. People were floored. And that was a killing blow to the perceptron. Now, incidentally, that should have been only a killing blow for the perceptron. But two, maybe one year and a half later, unfortunately, Rosenblatt died in a, in a boating accident. And he couldn't popularize the fact that he had actually discovered how to address this problem. And because of that, the field was set back for at least 10 years. So if it works, let's take a look at a, an, a, an illustration of the problem that um, uh, Marvin Minsky described. So here, you, you have something that is basically like a perception, a linear model. Here you have the decision boundary that is learned by this model. So you can see here it's wrong. It's trying to discriminate between the orange class and the blue class, but not doing so very well. But if you train it, boom, very fast, it can learn the correct thing. Uh, and you can imagine that for many problems, you can actually put a line between them, as you saw in the practical one, if you have very, very good features. Unfortunately, you, you don't always have good features. And a lot of the times, your problem doesn't actually look like this. It can look maybe something like this, right? So now the orange class is circling the blue class. And you can see there is absolutely no way of putting a line between them. And so that, that is basically what uh, Marvin Minsky realized, that you cannot solve nonlinear problems with the perceptron. So that was that. Like I said, for 10 years, people just gave up. But you know, in deep learning, people are just hard-headed. And uh, they never stop. And uh, thankfully, they never stop. Because uh, in parallel, uh, in 1980, around in the, in the mid-1980s, Rommel Hart and Jan LeCun and their collaborators achieved a breakthrough. Basically, they showed that um, if you use the method called backpropagation, which I'll describe in this talk later, um, you can now train perceptrons that don't just have one neuron. Now they can have many, many neurons. And these neurons can have um, complex architectures, let's say, for example, being built up as layers. And they showed that using that approach now, uh, you can actually unlock the true potential of the perceptron. Because remember, the perceptron is just one neuron. If we only had a single neuron, we wouldn't be very intelligent. And uh, let me give you a, an example of the, just a taste of what these additional neurons do. Oh, so I have to mention, um, if you want to play with this right here, this is like the TensorFlow playground. And you can just find this by uh, Googling those keywords. All right, so again, you're using this, very easy to solve. But then if you move on to the nonlinear problem, it's game over. So if you add more neurons, as I've done here, you, you, you can simply add them like this. You press play. You can see that now it's sort of doing, it's, it's doing something better. And the way it's doing it is that so this, these are the input neurons, and this neuron is basically saying how far to the right you are, and this neuron is saying how far to the top you are. If you're just using this two, as you can see, they're not splitting the space in a way that the final classifier can do anything useful. Whereas if you had the, the two neurons following it, now it's splitting the space in a more useful way for this problem. It's a pre-processing. It's basically saying, well, I want to know if the input is in the bottom left, or is it in the top right? And by using these, the, this like pre-processing of the data, it's much easier to make the final prediction, because now you can say, well, if either of these neurons is, is, uh, is active, then I'm going to say it's the blue class. If, are, if both of them are negative, I'm going to say it's the orange class. We're going to revisit uh, this, this functionality of hidden neurons later. But 
This is just to give you a sense of what they're doing. Okay, so these are the lasting insights from this iteration. You want to pre-process the data, but you don't want to actually be smart enough to actually know how to do that, because that, that's what you want your machine to do. You want your machine to be smart for you. Second thing is use back propagation. Uh, but unfortunately, nothing is easy in this world. And there, there wasn't a single paper that destroyed this iteration of quote unquote deep learning, but I think this is pretty representative, basically saying that back propagation fails where the perceptron succeeded. And the reason is that, well, the perceptron was a very, very simple model, so it was very easy to actually prove that I have the correct line. But now, if you can learn anything, it's hard to prove that you're learning the right thing. And so people were very, very discouraged, and for 10 more years, they were like, ah, oh, forget about this like, neural network thing. It's never going to work. That is until uh, around the same set of people came up and said, well, actually, you can. So in 2006, Jeff Hinton, Joshua Benjo, and Yann Lequin made another breakthrough. And this time, all they really did was kind of devise uh, tricks that allowed you to practically and reliably train multi-layer networks. And the reason people thought it worked is because now you actually had very, very compelling practical uh, results. So, uh, and you can also understand a little bit better what these models were doing. So for instance, they realized that each layer was kind of modeling a layer of abstraction. So the first layer would kind of detect very, very simple patterns in the input. So this would be like a sort of uh, edge detector, right? So it's detecting that uh, there's a face transition. And then it would put all of these together and learn parts of a face, let's say if you were trying to detect faces. And then all the way to the top, it would detect a full face. And so, as you know, people got really excited about that. Uh, and some of the reasons were, for example, in computer vision, where for decades people have been trying to understand what the hell is going on inside of a picture. It turns out that it's very difficult to kind of encode that manually, right? Because like, there's so many ways to uh, put pixels together. You can't really say, put a rule that, well, uh, a chair is, looks pr particularly like this. There's no canonical example of a chair because there's so many ways uh, that they can appear in real life. And this is where deep learning made a difference. And this is due to the work of Alex Krzyzewski and uh, Kaiming Her more recently. Just to name a few, there's like thousands of papers now uh, dedicated, to, dedicated to that very problem. But basically, how you can see the impact of deep learning is that, so this is when deep learning was introduced for those problems. You can see that it engendered a pretty huge drop in, in error. So this, this was the number of errors on average that I was doing on ImageNet, which is one of the most challenging problems for uh, image, image detection. And um, you can see that within the span of a few years, uh, you went from 28% error to 3%, right? And the impact wasn't only on computer vision. Even if you took speech recognition, uh, with the work of George Dahl and, and his collaborators, Hinton, you were able to reduce the error rate by more than half. And this is why now all these personal assistants are, are coming up. Because now, thanks to deep learning, we're closer to something, uh, closer to human performance. And again, you've probably heard of like the work of Volodymyr Mny on uh, playing Atari just from looking at the actual screen. And David Silver and collaborators more recently had a amazing achievement in beating uh, a Go world-class master. This is something that people thought was more than like 10 years away. I thought when they made some announcement that, what, like they, they beat like a, a, an amateur and they actually beat a, the best of the best. So deep learning really is a powerful tool. And its power just comes from leveraging this simple principle. You want turtles all the way down. And instead of being super smart, just use an army of neurons to do the job for you. And just by doing this, um, that's enough to solve many of the problems that we care about. All right, so that's it for the historical introduction. Yeah, absolutely.
no, uh, so I think it, it's very much more applied to neural networks because neural networks is a very kind of ill-defined term because many things can fall into the umbrella of neural networks. But you can have deep versions of, let's say, k-means clustering. So you, you could see that you could have the means be hierarchical. So first, uh, so, so just to explain what I mean by k-means, you're just basically trying to learn clusters of examples. Well, you can have subclusters of examples, and these clusters can be sp spread into many other clusters. So that's one technique that uh, has been driving some improvement in clustering, for, for instance. Uh, but also to answer your question about, you know, is deep learning really connected to neural networks? I mean, it, it's a historical, I would say it's, it's very much of a historical thing because it's so much easier when you have something like a neural network where it really is just a function and and so you can make it as, as deep as you want, basically. Yeah. All right, so let me talk about modern deep network architectures. This is one of them. It looks complicated at first, but as you'll see, just like with the neuron, it, you're using very, very simple and logical rules to build them. This is how uh, this section will be subdivided. We're going to talk about what the layers of the neural networks are actually doing. We're going to talk about activation functions, which, which decide how each neuron fires. We're going to talk about objective functions, which is what you use to evaluate if the network is doing the right thing, and which will also be useful for learning. We're going to talk about representational power, so uh, can we actually s solve like XOR? Spoiler alert, of course. Um, we're going to talk about regularization, which is how to make sure that your network will actually work on examples that it hasn't seen, which is the whole point of machine learning. And then we're going to talk about, you know, what is learning. We're going to talk about backprop and how to use it. All right, so this is a, a typical deep network. Like I said, usually it is really just a set of layers of neurons. Um, so this is the basic component of a layer. It looks exactly like the perception because it is an evolution of the perception. You just have your inputs, which is like a vector. You multiply them by a set of weights. You get the sum of them. And then you apply what we call an activation function, which decides how they fire. So for now, you can just think about it as the step function, basically saying 0 if negative, 1 if not. But then we'll, we'll talk about some better activation functions. Um, so as I said, one run is not enough. You have to have many. So here I show you three neurons. Uh, we can rewrite that as this equation here in the middle, where you can see that each neuron is producing an output A0, A1, AM. And uh, the formula for our output is that you take your activation function, which I denote sigma here, uh, and you apply it on the sum. And you can see that we don't want all the neurons to be learning the same line. So we're using different numbers for each of the, the slope values for each of these lines, right? So instead of having just one number that you multiply by x0, you're going to have two indexes to that, to, to w. So really, it's a matrix. And once you realize that, you realize that, well, you can rewrite the middle formula into a single formula that is much more concise, and which is basically saying that the output, which is a vector, is simply just the matrix product of W, which are the slopes, our so-called weights, times the vector X plus B, and then you apply sigma on each of the elements of that vector. And X here, uh, just to explain the notation, is a vector uh, of dimension N of real numbers. W is a matrix where uh, one dimension is N for the input, and M, which is the number of neurons, so here it would have been 3 for m. b is, recall, it's the intercept, but in deep learning, we also call it the biases. Um, and o is the output. So basically, a single layer is just doing a transformation of the input. You go from x, which is in rn, and you bring it to o, which is in uh, rm. And when you put that together into multiple layers, what that really means is that uh, you take x, so here it, c it could be an image, and the way you would represent the image as a vector is that you take each pixel intensity of that image one by one, 
and you put that in a vector. Uh, then you take x, multiply it by w1. So the one here is not an exponent. It's just to say the, the parameters for the first layer. Uh, you pass it through the sigma. That gives you h1, which are the hidden units for the first layer. And then you use that as input to the second layer, which you see written here. So instead of starting back from x1, we start from h1, multiply it by w2. Again, 2 here, the 2 here is not an exponent, just to say uh, the second parameters, the parameters for the second layer, same thing over and over. And so all the way until like the output. And the output here is special in the sense that just like the input, you have to decide on some format to understand what is the output of the neural net. And we'll talk about different formats that you can use. But uh, what you have to understand now is basically, like I was alluding to before, you can just write the neural net as one single function, right? And this is what you have here. And it's just really long. And uh, like Willie was saying, it has a lot of parameters. So instead of having one parameter, two parameters, typically you might have 20 layers, but 20 layers written just like this, uh, and maybe like a billion parameters, but all of them following this very, very strict structure. Um, now let's talk about activation functions. So for the activation functions, all you really want is that it's a nonlinear function that modulates the response of the neurons. And you need them to be nonlinear because otherwise your whole classifier will just be linear. And then you'll be right back to a perceptron. So as homework, if you, if you want to try it out, you can prove to yourself that this is the case. So you just take uh, that, that previous equation and then you remove the activation functions and then try to see why it's uh, linear. So what people typically use for the hidden units, which are the units that are not in the output and not in the input, is uh, the ReLU. So the ReLU was found to be really, really uh, useful in practice. And this is starting from the work of uh, Xavier Glow and his collaborators in 2011. But it was actually already pretty well known all the way back in 2000s by neuroscientists who had already discovered that if you actually look at how, what, what is the activation function that you find in the brain, and you plot out the input currents that you put in the neuron, and you measure the firing rate of that neuron, it kind of looks like flat when it's negative, and then it kind of looks like the identity. You can approximate it by the identity when it's positive. So this is that function that you have here, and this is what we call the ReLU. So essentially, like I said, the max zero x really just means uh, when this is negative, it's zero, and then otherwise, it's just a straight line. This is very boring, but another advantage that it has be besides being very, very good in practice, is that it's easier to understand what the network is doing. And uh, that allows us to have some insight into neural networks. So previously, people thought that it's just a black box and there is absolutely no need to try to understand what it's really doing. And what more recent research has been showing over and over again is that, in fact, we can understand what these networks are doing. So here I'm, I'm basically going to talk about the work of Guido Montufar in his paper uh, uh, cited below. So basically what they found is that um, networks that have ReLU units are basically breaking down the space into piecewise linear regions. And learning then is just basically figuring out what are the proper regions. So these are these squares here that I write. And you just put a lot of these squares on, on whatever function that you're trying to approximate. And bel a, a data point is identified to be in that square depending on the corresponding value of the hidden units. So depending on how the hidden units are activated, so here, because the first run is active and the last run is active, it'll go to that region here. But if we turn off, say, the first hidden unit, it'll, it would go to the one on the left, let's say. And so learning is just this process of figuring out what you want the function to, to look like when you're in a certain region. And that allows us, for instance, to try to figure out, well, what happens when we add uh, neurons? And this is a question that people had for a long time. Uh, so in the interest of like breaking the ice 
uh, just like Willie was talking about, I would like to maybe ask you this question. So here I show you a network with three inputs and two hidden units, and then I show you the regions that it's kind of learned to try to approximate the function. But here I have a network that is like much deeper and thus has more units. What do you think happens to the number of regions? Yes? Oh, so here I'm just, th imagine this was like a regression problem and you're just trying to um, make your network have the same shape, right? So here we just picked like a random function. I think this is like x2 plus sine, something like that, sinus of x. The size of the region? Okay, so that's what the network is doing by um, changing the slope and, and the bias. It can actually increase the size of the region that way. The size of the region. Anyone would like to venture a guess? Like, would the, would the number of, yes? Yeah, it's, it's basically what happens. It's, it seems pretty obvious, but uh, people didn't have a, a proof that that was the case. And so basically what they found is that, yeah, basically it just adds more squares. And they went further than just determining that it adds more squares. What they found is that it adds exponentially more squares. So this is a very, very efficient way of approximating a function. And how you can convince yourself that it's adding an exponential number of regions is if you think back to this little graph here, I said that a region is identified by um, how the, the numbers in the hidden units, whether they're on or off. And so on or off, zero or one, you can see that if you add a hidden unit that has the potential to be zero or one, that is growing exponentially the, the number of, uh, of possibilities of on and off that you can have. So that is why it's, it's a very efficient way of uh, representing networks. Another result that they found is that uh, they answered this question uh, that was really uh, troubling people, which was, well, should we add hidden units to the same layer or should we make the networks deeper? What, what is the point of making the networks deeper? And the answer they came up with is that adding layers is a way to get more regions but for exponentially less parameters. And, and the reason is because you're, you're reusing some of these numbers to kind of function as an if-else for the other neurons. So again, getting a, an exponential gain. So let's come back to, to the demo that I showed you before, where we have like different, uh, where we can kind of like play with the architecture of the network. And right here, we're going to start with this example again. And you can see it's kind of like approximating the function, but it's not quite the correct function. So does anybody have like some idea of what I could do to like improve the approximation of, uh, of this network? Yeah, add a, let's try adding a layer. Start over. Oh, one second. What happens? Okay, it's, I mean, it's, sli it's slightly better. More ideas? Okay, great. <laughs> Simple. Okay, uh, so basically that's what people find in neural nets. Uh, a lot of times the answer is just add more neurons. Like you have a problem, it's like you'll talk, 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 and then the answer, oh, actually, it's, it's better to add the neurons early on. So this is like an, an intuitive thing. Voila! <laughs> Congratulations, guys. <laughs> you solved this problem. Uh, okay, wait a, wait a second. So we're going to look at this like that. Okay, and you can see this is the region, region business that I was talking about before. So that last layer here that you see depicted here, it's basically carved out this like region, right? And you can see it's like a... Uh, uh, like an origami, yes. Great question. Um, 
the reason is, if you're thinking about a program, right, um, and you had a if else, you have you had two if else's. Um, I don't know if that's the best way of explaining it, but I, I guess, I, I guess, if you had a two switch two switch functions, right, and by switch I mean like you know it can choose between four things. It's better to have it. The first one will be more powerful because it will allow you more possibilities. It, it can lead to more possibilities. Whereas in the end, you're just choosing between four things. That's not very powerful, right? But if you choose between four things first, and these four things decide two other things, now, now, now you have four times eight. Four times two, sorry, right? Does that make sense? So it's just, it allows you to have more possibilities by pulling it early on because each of these neurons can kind of modify the behavior of the neuron coming after it. And the cool thing is that contrarily to, I'll let you in on a little secret, you can actually look at what your neural network is doing and actually right away make sense of it. Like I said, it's really just doing like regions. Um, so you look at this neuron here. So right, you have four neurons there. I can look at this neuron and you see it's illustrated here. It's splitting the space in two. Here, it's, put, it's splitting the space, again, in two. Like I said, it's always lines. Uh, yes? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's a... Uh, very, very important question that basically set people back for like 10 years. And people came up with all sorts of solutions and basically I spent my whole PhD working on one set of solution and uh, after quite some research, people realized that, oh, we had been fools because you, you can solve this vanishing, the vanishing problem occurs because of the activation functions, right? Because of their shape, you can kind of like, um, you can lose signal. But here, because this is just identity, you never lose any signal. Any way that you go back, even if you go back, you take the derivative of this function, it'll just be zero when it's negative and one when it's positive. And turns out that's all you needed to do. Now, you, and just with this, you can train very deep networks. And then there's another technique that is even more simple that allows you to train networks with like 100 layers. Yes? Uh, was there a question? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but just to give you an idea. Um, typically, you want to have enough layers. Oh, sorry. You want to have your your the width which is like the number of neurons in a single layer, be just large enough, but beyond a certain size, it's always better to add them as additional layers, right? So basically just, just big enough, and then you, you just backtrack, and then you try to see, could I add this as, as, a, as another layer? So it's an it's a iterative process. You have to iterate, yeah. But Again, I, I, I'll talk about it a little bit later. This has a lot to do with regularization. This is how you can regularize your network. So if I come back, yes? Yes, that's exactly what I was going to. Perfect. OK, so let me try to re reproduce the exact architecture we had. I think it was like that. Then we had, OK, boom, very fast, awesome. Um, so yes, so as I was saying, you're basically splitting the space in two. This is the first layer, and you can see here it's saying, well, am I on the top half when I look like this? Am I on this half? But what you can see that's very interesting is that it's basically trying to cut out the orange ones, right? So you can see on the, on the blue area, it mostly has orange ones for this neuron. And then, huh, what a coincidence. This other one is looking at the orange, oranges on this side. 
And this is a very simple region because this is the first layer. This is just linear. But then if you build regions on those regions, you look here, this neuron is basically using uh, that region and that region. And by combining them together, now it can better isolate the oranges. If you look at this one, well, this one already almost solved the problem just by looking at, at all of the neurons together. But anyway, let's say, and this one also, <laughs> same. But basically, by looking at these four neurons, now the final neuron can do a better job. So, so that's the idea of, of regions. Basically, you're trying to split the space in a way that for the next layer, it's easier to split the space into a more um, useful like region. D does that make sense? Yeah. So that's it. So this is just an example with like points, but uh, everything can be represented as, as points, right? So you have an image, you put it in a vector. Vector is just a point in a high dimensional space. Convince you a little bit more of that. Um, let's look at uh, the difference between k-means and neural nets. So k-means here is just basically the idea that you have, instead of like learning a complex representation from a function, you're basically just going to say, I have a set of examples that I know. And whenever you see a new image, you just go, does it look like this example that I know? Does it look like this one? Does it look like this one? And then you just go through the list. And when you find the one that it looks like the most, you just say, well, that's what I think it is. And you put a one where um, the example that you know that is closest is. Like, so this is the representation that k-means would learn. And there, as, there are as many numbers as patterns that you know. And then you just say one for the closest pattern that you know. So this motorbike that you see here, basically, it's closest to this index right there. But this truck here is closest to this index right there. But the problem with this approach is that, well, I mean, there's so many ways that you can have motorbikes. There's so many trucks. But here you can only recognize basically as many as you have in your representation. And moreover, you don't even realize that even though these are not the same class, I mean, th there's a lot of things that are similar between these two images. Like, if, if you could just, like, make the representation more compressed, right? If it could kind of understand you know, oh, these images are like mostly similar, but here are the few th ways in which they're different. And this is what the neural net can do. Because it's not simply saying, oh, like, what else do I know that looks like this? It's, it's just learning independent neurons, each of them trying to look at something completely different in the data. And this is the kind of representation that it could learn. It could try to, you could have one neuron trying to detect, so you can't really see. Oh, I guess you can kind of make it up. So this is the grill of your truck, one neuron is kind of interested in figuring out the grill, and we'll put that as the first neuron. Uh, the other one is interested in, let's say, finding like the light, and then you have one neuron for the wheel, and then you these same neurons, so let's say the neuron for the grill, you can see that, well, there's a grill in this image, and you'll, you'll turn it on for a truck, but you won't turn it, up, turn it up for a motorcycle. But then both have wheels, and so the two neurons, the, the neuron for wheels, will be active for both, and this is what you have in red here. So basically, this neuron will become, um, a kind of shared, uh, a shared feature for both of these problems. So whenever you'll see an image of motorcycle, that will help you better detect wheels in trucks as well. So you're, you're getting more bang for your buck for the data points that you're, saying, that you're seeing. Uh, another reason why this is important is because now you can kind of represent your classes in a more efficient way. Instead of saying like, well, motorcycles always look like this, you'll say, well, a motorcycle has wheels, it has handlebars, but it doesn't have uh, a grill. And so that can be your rule now for detecting uh, trucks in a way that doesn't depend too much on the specific trucks that you've seen. And you can think of that kind of like as attribute-based detection. Right? Uh, so an attribute would be tall, or like um, walks, or has a tail. And then you're just, each neuron is kind of like discovering these attributes all by itself. So to recap, oh, actually I had an example, forgot about that. Um, 
hopefully it manages to load. Bear with me one second. I think it's like a, actually a pretty cool example, but a lot of JavaScript to download. Let's go back. Oh well, well, I guess uh, I'll skip that one. But uh, basically, I wanted to show you uh, a look inside of a network that is actually doing something non-trivial. But uh, I guess it's like too big. <coughs> oh no, that's just like my next slide. <laughs> so anyway, this is this this will do for now. Uh, let's recap. You know what the networks are doing inside. They're learning distributed representation, which you can think of as like attribute-based representation. They're sharing features between problems. So, you know, if you know how to take something tall and you understand the concept of tall, that'll be useful for detecting if a person is tall or if a car is tall. You don't have to independently each time learn separately uh, these concepts. And then you're doing compositionality because you're putting together these like sample features. So again, uh, this is what these networks are doing. You take the image, boom, first level, something simple like edges, and then object parts, and then full objects. And then you read the output. So let's talk about how to read the output. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in fact, um, because training neural nets takes so long, so for a while, uh, two years ago, sometimes we would, I would train networks for like two months. So you don't want to have to go through that for every paper that you're writing, because typically you're like starting to write it like one week before the deadline, so there's just, <laughs> just can't fit enough time. So you have to do something. So this is why the whole like conference of like CVPR in computer vision, Usually, they'll just start from a network that was already trained by someone else, and that person was kind enough to give them the network. And so you can transfer those features, and that's one of the beautiful aspects of having an attribute-based network is that, uh, yeah, if you want to detect a completely new class, so uh, it was just detecting, let's say, uh, just dogs, norm dogs normal, normal dogs. Now, all of a sudden, you want to apply it to detect different types of horses. This can work, and people have written papers about that. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So there's actually some of the recent papers applying convolutional neural networks, which we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit. And also, you're going to get a whole session on that tomorrow by Nando. Um, one of the first works on uh, cancer detection actually was also using pre-training from ImageNet, which has nothing to do at all with cancer. No demo. OK. Sad. Uh, all right, so let's talk about how to do classification. So if you recall from this morning, this is basically trying to take, a, take an, uh, an input and trying to figure out which of the categories that you care about does it, does it belong to. So here, if you have images and you want to know, well, is it a car, a truck, or a bicycle, you want to have something that will tell you, well, I think it's like 95% chance that it's a car or a 3% chance that it's a truck. And then you can use that to make you know, uh, the appropriate decision. And for these problems, we typically use the softmax. So all the softmax is doing is basically just taking the scores that are coming from your network, and then you want to transform them into a probability. So you do that by taking uh, the exponential of the negative of the score for that specific class. So x here is not the actual input. It's the score coming out of your neural net. And the ith di dimension of that vector corresponds to the quote unquote score for that class. And then you just normalize it. So basically, divide by the score of all the classes. And that should make it sum to 1. And that's it. That's, that's the softmax distribution. 
And uh, basically, it allows you to get probabilities over your classes. Uh, the second popular type of output for a neural net is for multi-label problems. So here, you have an input, but it doesn't belong to a single category. It can have many categories that apply to them. So you, some, uh, another name for this is like uh, tag tags for an image. So basically, for this image, you want to say, well, yes, hot hair balloons. There's hot hair balloons in there. Sky. Uh, but then what you don't see up here is like not water, for instance. And what you can use to represent this type of output is sigmoids. So sigmoid is basically, and if you look, it, it kind of looks like the softmax. You can kind of think about it as a softmax, but where there's only like two classes, zero and one. And it has this like really nice shape. You take one over one plus exponential of x i, which is for the class i. And basically, this is telling you the probability that the class i is equal to one. And all it does is basically take the score, which is the number. And if it's very negative, it'll be very close to zero. If it's very positive, it'll be close to one. And that's it. Now you have a probability over each of your labels. And lastly, uh, we have regression, which is also super important because if you're in finance, this is what you're going to use to predict, you know, the stock market or you know something else to make money. And uh, here it's actually super simple because your output could be negative, positive, small, big. You don't use any activation function, and you just use the value of x. Right? So now we know how to produce something from the network, but we still don't know, is the network doing something correct, right? So you need something to like guide it, to nudge it, and, or to know how to nudge it even. And this is what we call the loss function. So it's called loss function because somebody called it loss function at some point and we just started using that name. <laughs> But I guess the better name would have been objective function, but that, that hasn't really caught on. So call it loss function. And uh, basically, the preferred loss function is just to do what we call maximum likelihood. So this is like this is just probabilistic modeling. Because as you recall, what you're getting from the network is a probability. So for each of the different types of outputs, there's a natural way to verify if your network is giving high probability to doing the correct thing. Very intuitive, right? So if you know that the, the class of a certain object is car, then you want it to give super high probability to car and very low probability to everything else. And you can do this very naturally by just measuring the probability that the correct label, so here your data set is the inputs and the correct label here. And here all you have to measure is the probability that the of the y index of, of your output is equal to 1 is large. So you take the log of that, and you do the minus so that um, it becomes a loss, so, so that you, know, you want to minimize. And uh, this form here just basically just boils down to taking the log of the output index by y. And that's it. Now you're just measuring, on average, so here you take the sum over the whole data set, right? And then you do one over the size of the data set. On average, what kind of like log probability am I giving to this data set? And you're gonna want to like bring that down, obviously. We're gonna talk about how to do that next. But beforehand, let's talk about what you do for multi-label multi problems. So here, uh, you have a set of sigmoids, and you can kind of think about that as a set of Bernoulli distributions. So again, you, it's the same idea. You're just doing, you just have to do a sum over all the classes. So for all the classes, you check that for that class, uh, it's either on or off. So y here is a, a, a vector, and it contains zero ones. So uh, the class at the index i can be 0 if it doesn't appear and 1 if it does appear. And then you just check that the output of the network fits. <laughs>
And when you expand that and you replace that probability here with the one that we had before, you get this slightly complicated looking black function. But really it's just saying uh, whenever y is one, you want to maximize the log of the probability of that network. And whenever it's zero, you want to ma maximize one minus the probability of the network, meaning the probability that the class is not there. And we call that the class entropy. Now let's look at regression. Here it's slightly more like complicated to understand, but uh, we're using no activation function, but you can treat that as if you had, you had some kind of Gaussian. And instead of you kind of like giving a probability, measuring a probability as the loss, you're measuring the density. All complicated words is to just say, in the end, something very intuitive. Uh, you, if, if your label is y, so you wanted your network to produce a vector that looks like y, um, you just take y minus the output of the network, you take the norm, so basically square the numbers, sum them together, take the square root, and then square it. So you remove the square root. So in the end, don't, don't, don't do the square root. Um, and uh, you can show that this is the same as doing Ma as minimizing the negative log density of a Gaussian. But if, if you're interested in figuring out why, uh, I, s I encourage you to try to prove it yourself. And all you have to do is just look at what is the density of a, a PDF of a Gaussian. And then you'll see the links scream at you between the, you know, the mean squared error, which is this, and the log density. All right. So. As we had discussed, one, one major downfall, the first downfall of the neural nets was that they couldn't learn very much. Uh-oh. Uh Seems like I'm not on the network anymore. Sucks because I had some more demos. Aha! It's working now. Okay, awesome. Uh, so, here I wanted to show you that uh, obviously by adding more layers, we can solve more and more complicated problems. So here's a slightly more complicated problem. Let's look at what the network is doing. Oof. In this case, nothing good, but we, we'd have to like play around with it. Uh, but ultimately, if we played around with it enough, maybe we could learn the correct thing, right? And for a while, people uh, asked themselves the same question, and so it became important to figure out, well, what can neural networks learn? And this is the subject of pr two pretty important papers, one by Sebenko and the other by Kurt Ornick, where they showed that actually uh, neural nets are what we call universal approximators, meaning that if you have like any function that you want, right, as long as it's smooth, um, there is a neural network, big F, that with a finite number of parameters will approximate it to any level, to any degree that you want. And so the degree here just means that um, you take the output of big F, which is your network, minus the output of the true function, take the norm of that, and it's going to be under epsilon, provably. And then you can make epsilon smaller and smaller and smaller until it decreases to zero by adding more finite capacity. And the way you can kind of like prove this to yourself kind of intuitively is again, if you go back to this idea of the neural network is breaking things into regions, well, if you break it into like a, a billion regions, you can get like a really close like piecewise linear approximation of basically any function. And uh, that's, that's the idea. But unfortunately, that comes at a cost because as you know, if you watch any comic book movie, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So before with the linear models, you know, you couldn't solve a lot of problems that you cared about, but you never did something that was too crazy, right? So you underfitted, but you know, it weren't completely far gone. But now with the, the deep nets, you can overfit much easier, meaning that because your network can, do, can learn like any function, if you have few examples, it can start to hallucinate and start to think, well, you know, I could put a straight line between these two, but I'm an artist, so I'm gonna put like, you know, this like, I think it's cooler if it looks more like spaghetti and, 
And this is what happens. And trust me, in my experience, neural networks never do what you want them to do by themselves. You, you have to, like, force them. So what you want to do is just make them, like, be inventive, but not too inventive. You want to get it just right. So that brings us to the question, how do we get things just right? Well, you got to ask for it. And this is what we call regularization, which is basically some kind of uh, methods that allow the network to generalize or perform well on unseen examples. And you do this by relying on additional information that you can call like inductive biases. So in this case, if you ask the neural network, should I use like the blue function or the green function? Neural networks would definitely say, well, the, green fu the, the blue function is just better. Look at it. Like, you know, it's wonderful. But as humans, you can kind of see that if you had to bet money on it, you would say green for sure. And that's one of our inductive biases. You like things that are smooth. You don't like things that are weird. So let's talk about you know, the first regularization, uh, com complexity. And you can, you can decide how complex your network is going to be by controlling the number of hidden units. So this is what we were talking about earlier. Um, if you have few hidden units, you have few regions, you have, it will learn something that is simpler looking. And so, yeah, just train a, s a small network that will regularize your network. The second popular approach is called L2 regularization, also called Tikhonov regularization. Um, two different names, I think, because two different fields. Uh, but the idea is the same. Uh, you have the loss coming from the network. So this is L, D is the data set, and W are the parameters, you know, the the, the slopes of, uh, of the lines that the network is, is doing. And instead of just trying to use that as the measure of how well the network is doing, you're also going to add the norm of the slopes of the network or the norm of the parameters of the network, right? All these numbers that encode the knowledge of the network. And you're going to have some lambda which controls how much you're going to penalize the network for having big numbers in its slopes. And so you have smaller slopes, and you can kind of see intuitively, and you can prove this for a linear model, this really just corresponds to saying, I want my function to be smooth. Another way to look at it is like, if you had, if your network was like a polynomial, right? Polynomial x1, sorry, x to the power of 2, x to the power of 3, but then you multiplied the powers by some number alpha. Uh, if that number was big, then you could, you could oscillate really crazily. If that number is small for each of the orders, now it looks uh, more seamly, let's say. Okay. Um, another type of regularization which I alluded to is like a convolutional architecture. So here you're just leveraging the fact that for certain problems, you know that there are certain properties that the, the network should have. And instead of just like twiddling your thumbs and just hoping that it happens, you realize that it never happens. So you just, you just bake it into the network. What you're baking is that you want your network to be able to detect a dog wherever it happens in the image. Whether it's on the left, on the right, it doesn't matter. It's a dog. So you have one feature. And how are you going to do that? Sounds like kind of simplistic and stupid. But it is extremely powerful. Um, you're going to take that feature. And here, that feature is applied as a, over a block. So here, this is the image. And you're going to take a patch of the image. And you're going to apply your filter. You're going to apply your feature detector. Then you're going to apply it more on the right, on the bottom. You're going to apply it everywhere. And everywhere that you've applied it, you will write at the output the, the value of that feature for that specific location. So here it thinks, nah, th there's probably not a dog here, but there's definitely a dog there and there. So you're just basically replicating uh, that neuron virtually everywhere. And this is actually just a convolution, which is a very efficient um, thing to do. And that's the basis of convolutional neural nets, which have basically revolutionized computer vision. And originally, uh, we, we owe this approach to Fukushima, and Yann Lequin was the one who figured out how to really train these networks. Another approach that you can use for language is 
just realizing that you know that features detected on text will be useful for each of the words in the text. So the solution is you simply recursively apply the same function at every time step, and you use what you learned previously to modulate what you know now. And so this is uh, the basis of a lot of work on language, where this is, uh, oh, this is a network that's kind of like reading this Chinese sentence. And the idea of, of recurrent nets, which leverage this structure, is that you will read each word one by one and then keep going. And that allows you to deal with sentences that have any size that you want, because you, you really are just applying the same thing over and over. And we owe this type of architecture to um, uh, Opfield, and it was perfected by uh, Ockreiter and Jürgen Schmidtberg in their paper, Long-Term, Short-Term Memory. All right, so I've talked about like a bunch of regularizations, but uh, which should you use, and when should you use them? And I'm going to use like some really, really recent work uh, from this year, from uh, Google Brain and DeepMind, I guess, a collaboration. First author is uh, is Yang Xiuan. And basically, what he did is uh, he he compared many models when you're using L2 and not using L2. So basically, when you're encouraging the network to be more smooth. And here we'll start out with. Uh, uh, MLP, so this is multi-layer perceptron, so this is just a deep network with one layer. And we're going to try without L2 and with L2. What you see is that, well, this hurts your training accuracy, which is just looking on the, the, on the data that you're trained on, um, which makes sense, because if you're smoother, your network can't do as much, so it can't memorize the training set as much. What is surprising is that it does kind of the same thing on a test accuracy. So if you only ever trained one layer you know, deep networks in your life, you would think, well, L2 sucks. You should never use L2. And you'd be wrong. Because here, here comes deep learning all the way with like three layers now. Okay? So this basically the same network. We're using less hidden units. And we're adding those hidden units as layers now. Right? So you have the same number of like, over, is, you have the same size for the network in terms of number of parameters. But now you just have more layers. What you see is now, Adding the L2 doesn't hurt the train accuracy at all. And having L2 actually increases the accuracy by 1%. So I should add that this is on ImageNet. So this is actually a, a, a challenging problem. And so that 1% actually matters. But what's even more interesting is that if you compare the one layer uh, deep net with the three layer one, you have a 2% increase. So it seems that. It's very important to choose the structure of the model correctly, right? If you have the wrong structure, you can try a bunch of regularization. It's not going to matter as much. If you have the right structure, you're going to get a nice boost, and regularization will work. But that's only using an LLP. Let's choose an even more powerful architecture. So now we're using the convolutional architecture that I, that I talked about earlier. It's called AlexNet because the guy I came up with it was called Alex. <coughs> and everybody calls it the AlexNet. Uh, so now you have this convolutional network. Again, 100% accuracy. But this doesn't really matter because you don't care about the training examples. You care about the test examples. And what you see is this titanic improvement. And now you know why you know, the, the model is named after him. Because that's like 20 points. That is a huge boost. And it's faster to train. Again, you can see, you can, uh, you, if you add L2, you're going to squeeze some more performance out of it. But really, you want to use the right structure. That's what will give you the win. Then later on, uh, Google Brain came up with the inception architecture, which is just like you know, ConvNets on steroids. And this gives you another 10% boost, just like by fiddling with the structure. So this is my advice. Whenever you're training on a new problem, you got to spend time to try to understand what people have done before in terms of the structure. What what do they know that you don't know about this problem that you're trying to solve? And you, you put that into your solution. That will give you the, the most increase in performance. And then you can kind of worry about the last few percents of performance by you know, tweaking regularization, like the, the more conventional penalty-based regularization methods. <coughs>
All right, so now you know how to properly judge a network. Now, how do we use that to train? Well, uh, it's basically a search problem. So you have your loss function, which tells you how stupid your network is. And you want to find some you know, configuration of the slopes, w are the parameters, that makes it less stupid. So one way that you could think about solving this problem, you know, the first way you can think about it is just like, you just try everything, right? And that would be one way to do this minimization process. You just like, you know, roll coins, then you just hope that at some point, you know, one of them has a lower uh, loss than the one you started with. Obviously, don't do that. Uh, that. That would take like way too much time, and deep learning would suck. Like, no one would use it. Uh, there's a better algorithm, and so Wheelie talked about it. It's called gradient descent. Um, so just like to refresh your memory, um, just like you can kind of visualize what the hidden units of a network are doing by plotting them out, you can do the same thing with the loss function of your network. So the loss function is always a single number, right? And that single number would be like the average probability of doing the right thing, right? So here it's, it's j of w. And w is your parameter. So here in this case, I just show like a param one parameter because that's like easy. And you can see that you can move the parameters. If you move too much to the right, well, your loss is like super high. And you, like it sucks. But if you go more towards where you have the w here, you get good performance. That's the lowest performance that you can reach. And uh, just to be clear, like, the blue line is that, 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 that the graph of, you know, dub, of the loss with respect to uh, W. And all gradient descent is doing is just measuring locally the, the slope of, of your loss and just moving in the direction that, so calculating gradients and moving opposite of the gradient to decrease the loss. And basically, in order for this to work, you have to tune just one parameter. That's usually a parameter that matters the most. It's called the learning rate. Here it's written as epsilon. So you have W minus epsilon. And this is nabla just to say you take the gradient of the loss. And it's actually really important because if you have the correct epsilon, you can prove that in a simple case, so in a convex case, uh, you can prove that you are going to recover the perfect parameters, right? This is just great, tremendous. Uh, but if you have the wrong learning rate, now you're going to bounce around wildly. And the reason is that you're just overshooting, 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 and you're never actually converging. Whereas if you use a too small one, you're, you're never going to get there. It's just going to take too long. So hopefully this demo works. Yes. So uh, you can access this demo on Distill, which is a journal that aims to like explain ideas in machine learning. So here, this, this is the step size. Again, like I said, there's so many names for things in machine learning. But this is the learning rate that I was talking about earlier. And basically, you can see that let's reduce the learning rate. Uh, and here you have so the starting point is the, where you're starting out your optimization process or your search process. The optimum here is where you're trying to get to. And this is what we call a contour plot. So the more dark it is, the better. That's, that's where you want to go. And the contour lines indicate uh, when the, the loss is the same. right? And you can see that if you use a very, very small learning rate, uh, that, that line, that orange line, is kind of how far you've moved. And each, each dot is like a step of gradient descent. If you use a zero learning rate, obviously nothing is happening. You're never moving. If you use a very, very small learning rate, you're going to make some progress. So it's better than your starting point. You can see, I think you can see it's like slightly darker. But you won't get very far. So you have to get it just right. So this would be the proper learning rate. So obviously, in real life, you don't have this like nice tool where you can just modify the learning rate and get the answer <laughs> right away. I know some of you are probably hoping that. That's, it's not going to look like that. But uh, you're going to, what, how it's going to look like is like you're going to set a learning rate. You're going to wait, hopefully, one hour, like if you're training a large problem, and then you're going to get an answer. And then you'll try another learning rate. If you're lucky, you have multiple computers, and you do that in parallel, OK? Um, but basically, that's if, for some reason, you were lucky. You never tried too large of a learning rate. Basically, the learning rate is just 
giving you this nice thing. But if you're unlucky and you didn't know what was the proper learning rate and you go too large, all of a sudden, whoops. And you can see the line even disappears at some point. I, <laughs> so, so just be careful. If, you, if, you, if you're training your network and then it's just like blowing up, you're getting large values, you know you've used the learning rate that is way too big. Uh, all right. So now you understand how to, what gradient descent is doing. But what I haven't explained is how do you even get that gradient? So as you recall, the neural net is really just like one really long function. And for any function, you can compute its gradient, right? But doing the gradient is like tedious, right? You don't want to spend your whole life like, you know, in a notebook writing a bunch of equations. So you let your computer do it. And this is what we call backprop. What you're doing is you're going to use the chain rule, and you're going to iteratively compute the gradients in reverse. So here, if z was a function of y, which is a function of x, and this is basically the structure of a neural net, just a composition of functions, you can get the gradient as d of z uh, partial with y, partial of y, partial of x. Right? So you split that gradient computation into a set of gradients. And you're, you're going to have as many of those as you have layers. So let's go through the process one by one. You start with the loss. Here, I assume that the loss w is like what we call you know, the mean squared error for regression. So you just take y minus o. And here, you have this network which starts from x. You, you have one layer of ReLUs. You get h1, h2, the output. And then you compute the difference between the output and your canonical labels. So a little bit of you know, calculus here just tells you that you, you take the derivative of this, you remove the 2, put it in front, this becomes 1, uh, and this, these two, the 2 cancels out. So obviously, that's not a coincidence. You know, that's why the 2 was put there. Um, there's a mistake, though. There's a minus sign, which is missing. But let's pretend that didn't happen. Um, and so that's the gradient for the loss. Now, as I said, you start with the loss and you start moving backwards. So normally you use the network forward, and you can call that forward prop. Now we're going to go in the opposite direction, literally the opposite direction. So now we use the chain rule, and we know that you know, the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters, w3, is just going to look like the derivative of the loss with respect to the output, and the derivative of the output with respect to that parameter. So now we just plug in what we got previously here. You get this. And the derivative of the output with respect to the parameters, well, this is just like here. Like it's like you had ax. The derivative with respect to x is just x goes away. And yep, this is what you get, h2. And you transpose that. And that is all you need. That's, that's the gradient for that you know, uh, top layer. Then you go back. Again, you get a chain rule, but this time it has three parts to it because you, you've moved back uh, two times, and now you're at the third uh, move. And then you can write that as well. You, you, know, you can compute that, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, back prop is just a dual of the forward prop. So in the, if in the forward prop, uh, you, t you took two signals, you added them together. In the back prop, you're just going to back propagate the gradient through both of them. If you did a copy, you're going to sum it. And that's it. And so learning is just basically going to be just moving your parameters closer to better parameters, little by little. And you can, you can see it in the loss surface. Right? You're getting closer to the best parameters. And you can also look at the learning curve, which is usually what you look at because this has like way too many dimensions. So think like one billion dimensions. It would take too long for you to like look through everything. So you'll just look at the error with respect to the comp versus the number of steps that you've taken. And then you just want that error to decrease as smoothly as possible. So again, also don't expect your losses to look like this. It's going to look like a mess, like usually. But this is just you know to m make you confident, right? Just to inspire the sense of confidence. But in the practical, it's probably going to just oscillate, but just be just 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 be like faithful. As long as it's going seems to be going down, it's good. 
But so far, I was always showing you this, like, really, like, nice-looking, like, parabola. Could it be that it's always a parabola? Or maybe it's like this, sometimes, like, the loss actually looks like this weird shape. Like, what do you guys think? Yeah, the, the weird shape, because, like, nature is not trying to give us favors, usually, you know? It's, it's, it's almost always kind of a weird shape. And uh, that, that weird shape has a name. It's called non-convex, meaning that it, it doesn't look like this parabola here. Meaning that uh, for the parabola, you can take two points uh, within that, w on, on that blue line, and you never, cross a po you never cross that function again, right? So there's no bumps in that function. That's what convex means. But non-convex means that you can totally, like, if, if you take two points, there could be an obstacle between those two points. So if you're at the, what, this is denoted local cost minimum here, and you want to get to the global minimum, that's not going to work because gradient descent is always making you try to decrease the loss. But there's no path that decreases the loss that goes from local cost minimum to global cost minimum. And so what happens is that your, your blue point, which is your parameters, can get stuck somewhere. So another way to look at that here is just basically this way. Depending on where you start your optimization problem, uh, you might end up here, or you might end up in a better spot. And that's worrisome because maybe some of these spots are, have lower performance, right? How, how do you know? And if you got to those spots where you, there's an inflection, the, the gradient here would be zero. So gradient descent cannot take you out of these points. So you would basically get stuck in a, in a suboptimal solution. And that's what this paper that I showed you early on that you know basically discouraged everyone from doing deep learning uh, pointed out. It just pointed out the fact that, well, how do we know whether we're going to converge to the correct function? And you can even prove that there have it has to kind of look non-convex. Because if you take the, no, the hidden units, if you just switch around hidden units, the parameters will look different, but it'll just do the same thing, right? Because like, the order of the hidden units doesn't matter for the network. And so if there is one solution, there has to be at least a combinatorial amount of solutions, which is just the different permutations of the hidden neurons. So that also means that if there's a suboptimal solution, there's a combinatorial amount of suboptimal solutions. So that's, that seems like it really sucks. But um, in around 2014, I just like measured some of these ideas. And it turns out that there's what we call like a blessing of dimensionality. So usually dimensionality is, is like horrible because like we only think in three dimensions and um, we have really bad intuition for dimensionality and we usually fear dimensionality. But in optimization, actually, nope. Turns out it's great. Because bad local minima turn out to be exponentially rare for really, really large scale problems. So problems like a billion um, parameters. And in, in fact, when you train like really large networks, what people have found, which was an enigma for a long time, is that you don't even need to do a bunch of random restarts. So like retrying a bunch of times randomly. And the reason is that experimentally, when we kind of look at the losses of these networks, Usually, if you have a suboptimal point, it's not suboptimal by a lot. So instead of looking like a very, very uh, bad squiggly line, it looks like this very nice squiggly line where, you know, wherever you converge, it's OK. And uh, that has led to more research from Ian Goodfellow and uh, Andrew Romanska just trying to understand why this is the case. Yes? What? Nautical? Theoretical? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's super counterintuitive, right? Because you would think, well, first of all, um, it's high dimensional. So how, what would that have to do with how the function looks like? That's the first thing. The second thing is, I guess, that seems like too much luck, right? So l let, me, let me give you an intuition for why that's the case. So, Currently, there's been some papers trying to prove that it's always the case for neural nets, but they all make some kind of simplifying assumptions. So we're not completely there yet to prove that it always looks like this. But 
Intuitively, you can understand why it would kind of look like this. If you have a high dimensional space, right, that means that you have many directions that you can move in. If you are at a local minima, it means that there's no way to improve um, your network, right? There's no, like, if you, imagine you have a billion dimensions. It means that in a billion dimensions, you cannot improve the loss. That's very unlikely, right? So in, in, like three dim in two dimensions, it's very difficult to avoid an obstacle. Three dimension, it's more easy. I imagine you have a billion dimensions where you can like avoid obstacles. Now it becomes a little bit more easy to understand why you can always avoid you know, the obstacles. And all local minimas aren't really, all things that kind of look like a local minima aren't actually a real local minima. Uh, does that kind of answer your question? Oh, 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 okay, okay, now I see your question. Very interesting, of course. So like I stated, there's what we call like symmetries in the parameters. So you can just permute the parameters and for sure prove that it's not convex. But in fact, it doesn't, the reason why it can still look like this even though you have these this like different subsets is because it doesn't matter which subset that you fall into, right? Because the, all the subsets kind of look the same, right? So, uh, looks like we have everything set up, right? Like, deep learning is cool, awesome. Maybe we don't need to learn anything? Well, mm, again, being over-optimistic is not the case. And uh, this was talked about a bit this morning. There's a theorem that is called like the no free lunch theorem. And it basically says that, uh, yeah, like there's, there's probably always gonna be machine learning research because any algorithm that you can come up with if it performs well on a set of problems, that means it must suck on other problems. So, you know, you can take it as good or bad news, depending on your perspective. So, the illustration here is just showing you that, you know, if you're great at detecting, like, uh, you know, shoes, you're gonna have to suck at detecting, like, apples. Obviously, that's not what the proof says, but, you know, I'm simplifying. <laughs> uh, but, again, maybe we are a little bit luckier. So, this is just a, a proof that you have to suck at the remaining problems, but this is when you consider every possible problem. But maybe there is a way to kind of get a bit of a free lunch, you know? Because maybe we don't care about certain problems. Maybe there's an algorithm that works on most of the problems that we care about, and then for the random problems that never appear, it sucks, and that's not a problem. But that's an open, uh, that's an open question. All right, so we're getting near the end. Let me recap uh, you know, this section on mo modern neural nets. Uh, first, um, I've kind of explained what the neurons do, and it's actually super simple, just doing weighted averages of their inputs. And then the activation function kind of decides how to fire that neuron, so whether it's active or not active. And basically, that's allowing you to create kind of these like locally, yes. Oh, this one, yeah. Okay, I, I think I understand what you're saying. So you're saying there's many ways that we can improve the models. Either we make them easier to optimize, let's say this is the Bastrom approach, or we just like improve the model itself. Um, it's, it's still open. It's still an open question, but definitely there is a relationship between the optimizer that you use and um, which kind of functions will work better. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the practical tricks. So what you end up getting is that, you know, DeepMind, they're always using like Atom. Facebook, because we, we're doing different problems, we're always using a different thing called like momentum. And just depending on the problems that you're using, the networks that you're using, you're gonna be using different tricks. And the reason is, well, I mean, for now, the reason is it seems there's no free lunch, there's not a silver bullet, there's not 
one algorithm to rule them all. And so this is something very important to remember. Like deep learning is, of course, as, as you can see here, it cannot be a silver bullet. So it is really just a tool, and you need to wield that tool. So you need to have some kind of knowledge here. Yes? Uh-huh. Ah, I see. I see. So you mean like first training it, let's say, in an unsupervised fashion, pre-training it, let's say. And so it's initialized to a pretty good solution. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So this feeds into like somewhat in, in the next session section, but um, usually people don't do that as much. So this technique was extremely popular in the early 2010s, but with the introduction of batch norm, um, the, pr the networks are now less dependent on initialization. And you're gonna talk about this tomorrow with uh, Nando, I believe. So not as much, but I still think it's a very, very interesting idea. And if there's one thing that you have to understand from my talk is like, um, you know, there's this like fake quote from Einstein that, you know, madness is like doing the same thing over and over again. You have to understand, in deep learning, you should do it over and over again, just deeper and deeper, right? That's, that's the motivation. And you have to keep trying and keep trying to circumvent certain problems that existed in imp improving things. So, you know, people were discouraged initially because they never use RNNs because of the vanishing problem, vanishing gradient problem. And then people realize, well, if you use the STMs, it works, right? People were discouraged from, um, you know, training perceptrons because it, it, it was too weak. Well, people realized, well, just put two neurons together. And now it, it solved that problem. So currently, there is a problem with, like, layer-wise pre-training, which is that it's somewhat inefficient because you have to do an extra step. But maybe there's a way to get around it. Yes? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's the eternal question. Um, well, you gotta, you gotta kind of like, you know, it's kind of like explaining, you know, how if you play baseball or if you play football, you know, how do you best kick a ball? You have to kick a lot of balls. Sorry, that sounds weird. <laughs> you have to train a lot of networks. That's better. Um, so basically, there's, there's no like a priori good rule, but usually you use like, a, what, what we call cross-validation. So you train the network with 10, let's, not 10, like 100 units. You look at the performance, and then you look, well, what happens when, if I like multiply by 10 with 1,000 units? Does it work better? If it does work better, then now you try 10 times more. You try with 10,000 units. And then that's how you can kind of, you know, with like a sort of bisective search, figure out how, how, uh, how many neurons you should have, but after a while you can kind of get a sense, right? Because you can see like, oh, this problem seems to be a little bit less complicated than ImageNet, and ImageNet uses, you know, like 4,000 neurons, so maybe I'll just train with like 500 neurons. That, that's kind of how it works. Okay, I see. So how do you know which unit should be active, which unit should be off? You, you don't know. Oh, which one got? Okay. Um, so when you're running your network, you, you can actually just look at the value of that neuron as, as it's running. Right? So you can stop the forward propagation through the layers and just measure that value for that neuron. So you have to... Basically, you're just like logging what your neurons are doing. 
Yes. No, I don't think we're in a rush. We have time. Yes, so that paper that I was quoting for that table is actually called Rethinking Generalization. So that problem that you're raising is the problem that they were raising. They, there's not a clear answer, but one of them is that it seems that deep neural nets are actually almost always overparameterized, first of all. Second of all, it seems that somehow they, they will throw out the unnecessary units naturally. Um, I think the regularization that they have, which is helping, is just that they're compositional, right? And a lot of problems in real life are actually just compositional. A second thing is that they're continuous and smooth, right? Because it's, it's a smooth function. Most problems are actually smooth because we're, we're in real life. Like, something not smooth is actually very costly, uh, you know, in, f in, f in physical terms. Yes, they're more, they're more limited, but they're limited to the sets of problems that we're actually using. So that's why I think, in general, they tend to generalize, but again, we're, we're still at the beginning of understanding why. Cool. Uh, any more questions? So. Yeah, of course. I see. Um, the reason is because it's, it's not detecting armchair in one go. There's not a, there's not, an, unlike k-means where it's just trying to see, does it look like one of the armchairs I know? And obviously we don't know a lot, so it, it won't find it. What it does is that it will look at other factors that even though, ev even if the armchair is like barely visible, it might detect the texture of the armchair, right? That's something that is easy to detect, regardless of you know, the positioning. As long as you, know, you can see the texture, that would be one thing. It can also use the context, because armchairs don't appear like you know, in the sky. If it sees a picture of a sky, it knows, well, there's no armchair there. Like it, it's never seen that before. And that's how you also detect things, right? Um, the context, right? So even if you may not see the computer here, you see that I'm pressing something, you know it must be the computer, right? That's th these correlations is what the network can use to kind of detect objects in more varied positions and, and configurations as well. All right, let me quickly run through the recap. Yes. Of course. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's just we, it's not as easy to prove, but, but yeah, I mean, almost certainly what they're doing is like, if it looks like this, it'll just put that, this, that same kind of tile there. Yeah. yeah. Yes? 
that's a that's a very fair question. So basically, here I'm just talking about you know the fundamentals. So I have not covered at all how to go beyond the perception problems. So not just vision, anything that has to do with understanding a signal. So also speech recognition, or you can think about understanding language also as a signal. So with this, you can, you can absolutely solve these problems. But as he's noting, um, the brain is not just doing perception. It's also doing reasoning. Um, but obviously, you, you will not be able to do reasoning about anything interesting if you don't have perception. So it's very important to have perception. But as far as reasoning goes, we're still in the infancy of figuring out how to get a, a neural net to do that. Um, one of the works, I think, which applies here would be uh, AlphaGo, where you want to reason about different possibilities. And what they're doing is combining the old world, like the old ways of uh, intelligence, which is like a tree search. So it's, it's doing a search over the different moves that the other player might make. And it's using the neural network, one, to guess what the other player would do. And it's also using the neural network to score uh, how, how how good that would be, how good that move would be, and what I could do in, in response. But you're using the tree search to kind of you know, explore the possibilities. So that's one way you can have some uh, form of reasoning. Uh, another thing which would kind of mimic reasoning would be to use reinforcement learning. So here, instead of um, trying to put something into class or trying to know that the stocks will be this high tomorrow, you're kind of using some kind of reward signal from you know, your environment to decide what you do next. So this is for the Atari games, uh, what allows the neural net to just like look. So use the perception from a, a convolutional neural network, plug that in into a, you know, a more regular network that is kind of using this perception to decide which action to take. And so that, that's some of the work in that area. There's also people trying to um, you know, do reasoning based on like knowledge bases. So Antoine Baldes is evaluating that. But if you want, we, I can tell you way more about it uh, offline later. But there's, there's definitely work in that direction. All right, so if there's no more questions, I'll just finish this recap. But if there are questions, don't hesitate. Um, so anyway, we talked about the ReLU, we talked about objective functions, which measure the quality of the network. The representational power is like, uh, it gives you everything you want. Yes? Yes? Uh, no. no. It's also why I didn't talk about dropout is because with the recent advances, you, you don't need it as much. So it's, you know, the field is changing very, very fast. Um, I mean, as, as you can see, as Stefan was saying, I had state of the art for like, Probably like two whole months we were celebrating and then this team kind of like crushed our dreams. <laughs> uh, another thing is like the field moves so fast that, uh, so that paper we had submitted to a conference, uh, ICML, which was in, I think, August. And before we even presented that paper, like that paper from Google Brain came out and we had to say, well, we don't have state of the art anymore, but like, <laughs> We're still going to talk about this work, OK? <laughs> and people are nice in, uh, in, in uh, machine learning, so they actually listen. So this is, this is great. The moral also is that there's always something to learn. It's not just about the numbers, right? So because, uh, as well, the, the speed of processing is also increasing all the time. So if you're just looking at the numbers, you're basically just figuring out who has the best GPU. So it's always important to look at the numbers, but also look at what's behind them, you know? It's like some methods are just, you know, a little bit more thoughtful. Not saying anything. <laughs> I don't know, but, but really. Uh, so yes, regularization, understanding, learning. Remember, just use backprop for everything. Uh, it's boring, but it just works. All right, let's let's talk about you know tips and tricks. Uh, I'm just going to talk about like three of them, and I'm going to talk about them very quickly, actually. So initialization that we talked about is Oh, like 
you're, you're making a lot of optimization people really sad right now. <laughs> they, they have proposed so many methods. Um, so for instance, you could use uh, genetic algorithms. So previously, people were like, never use genetic algorithms. And now recently, OpenAI was like, well, actually, if you use evolutionary systems, what's, what, what do they call it now? What, can, can somebody say it louder? Yes, neuroevolution. Yes. So if you use that, you can actually get pretty good performance. And this is just a way to do optimization without using gradients at all. So you're just using the function value, and you're just evaluating at many points, and then just using that to triangulate you know, where you can move. So there are different approaches, but don't try them. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I love optimization, but like, for now, for now just, just use backprop. Probably later we'll figure out something. Huh? Oh, oh maybe. <laughs> I have to admit. Um, so you want to know how to initialize your network because depending on where you put the starting point, it could take longer or shorter um, to find the solution. So the first idea, which people have tried, which is like a pretty huge mistake, but it seems like a great idea, is you just set zeros everywhere. So the the weights are all zero. The biases are all zero. Everything in your network that is a parameter is zero. It turns out that if everything is the same, everything behaves the same, everything gets the same gradient because they behave the same way, everything remains the same, and so you just have one neuron in your network. Like, so you're just wasting capacity. So you never want to do that. You want your networks to be initialize in such a way that all the units are doing something slightly different. And it might be wrong, but it's different. So at least they will start to, each of them learn something different and good. So to do that, you use random initialization, which is basically saying you want your network to kind of behave like a random Gaussian. And you're choosing random Gaussian because you assume my, my input is, ran, my, my, sorry, my targets are random Gaussians, right? So I don't know what, what is the proper output for this? But I'll just say, like, you know, it, it, just, it just looks random. And so you can work out that if you want random outputs, your parameters need to look a certain way. Uh, you can write the formula for the variance here, and the variance breaks down as number of inputs times the variance of the weights times the variance of x. If you assume the variance of x is 1, um, without loss of a generality, we'll explain why, you can recover the variance of your weights. So you realize that you should initialize your weights to be Gaussians that have uh, zero mean and that have the following variance. One over the number of inputs, square root of that. So that will just guarantee that as you move through the layers, the outputs just look like random Gaussians. But the problem with this formula is that I'm assuming that you have like no uh, activation function. Right? As you can see here, I don't have the ReLU. So if you put in the ReLU, this is what uh, Kaiming He did. Um, you end up actually with almost the same initialization formula, but with a two here. But this matters because uh, in practice, with that two, you get state of the art results. Without the two, you don't. So just use it. Um, okay, so uh, normalization, it was talked about earlier, but uh, let me like, you know, refresh your memory. Basically, you have, uh, you have your original data which actually doesn't have unit variance. It doesn't have zero mean. So you just, you know, you shift it, and then you resize it. And this doesn't actually affect your data because this is not a statistics that actually matter for your classification purposes. And so this is that formula that you use right here. And it turns out as well that it improves optimization. In terms of optimizers, um, yes. Uh, yes, you need to normalize your test set as well. But you normalize them using the, av the, the mean and the variance from the training set. So you never actually look at the test set. You just apply this pre-processing to it. Right? Yes. Yes, okay. So, you know, n no free lunch. There's, n there's no, like... You know, th there's nothing that is like the right thing to do. But 
there's what is usually the right thing to do. <laughs> right? So if you don't know anything, normalize it this way. However, if you're doing a competition and everyone is normalizing this way, maybe you look into other ways you know, that you can improve and you do this zero one. In some cases, let's say for a language, that could actually be better. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yes, you have to do it separately because if you do it all together, you're going to be cheating because you're going to be looking at this you're going to be looking at the test set. You shouldn't be looking at it. But now in practice, in most cases this will not actually change the outcome, but you, you want to have good practices because in some cases it could. You can do both, but usually you'll do a mean per item. Right? Because if you do a, a mean for everything, you're just assuming that each item is roughly the same, right? It's coming from the same distribution. But if you're doing measurements over like, you know, one of them is height, one of them is like hair color. These two things have very different means. So if you just learn the same mean for the two, it, it'll just look bad. Right. All right. So uh, I don't have that much time anymore, but uh, this is an illustration of like the different optimizers and what they do. They're basically just like different approaches to doing gradient descent. Um, here, this is momentum, and I'll just explain like the you know, the intuition behind momentum is that. You're, you can see your optimization process because it's taking like this like point and it's bringing it downhill. You can imagine it as like kind of like rolling a ball down a hill. And what is super helpful for rolling a ball down a hill, if you know, you know physics, is that that ball has inertia. So if it meets an obstacle, because it has inertia, it could keep going. And because it has inertia, there will be less oscillations. It'll move side to side less because it'll keep going uh, in the direction where there's a lot of movement. So that can speed up like optimization, and usually this is what people use for vision. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, oh, I will try to show this like example, which is like really nice. So before I was modifying the step size, and you can see that yes, the step size was like really important. Um, but if you use the step size that was like say like a little bit too large, you could get these like wild oscillations. But here, this is how much like, inertia I'm giving to the ball. If it had no inertia, you can see that it would oscillate way more crazily. Because it, it's not, it doesn't have inertia towards the direction where you really want to move. But by adding momentum, you can like, dampen these oscillations. So that's momentum. Another idea is RMS prop, which is uh, just the realization that maybe you want a different learning rate for each of your parameters. And RMS prop is a way to find that. That's very useful for language and reinforcement learning. To me, one intuition for that is that, let's say that you know, in reinforcement learning, you, one parameter was controlling this action and the other parameter was controlling this other action. Well, maybe there's one action that you don't see a lot and so you wanna move very fast whenever you see that action. You wanna learn faster for that action, not for the other one. And so RMS prop can do that. Uh, if you wanna know a little bit more about RMS prop, we can talk offline, just in the interest of time. So I had a section of, on application, but it's actually not necessary because this is just trying to ease you into the, the practical, so you can, you'll just see that on the practical. Um, basically, I, I think the most important part that I wanted to illustrate is what does the function look like? So this is TensorFlow, which you're gonna use for the tutorial, and you can see like, I'm initializing the parameters for the layer one, W1. It's a variable, meaning that we're gonna tune it and I initialize it at zero here, but here I initialize it as a random normal, and then how you compute it is a matrix multiplication between x and w0, you add your biases. It's like very, very convenient. You don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel and like rewrite a matrix multiply yourself. And you can do gradient descent just within these like few lines. Putting it all together, you can train this network on the right here with just these few lines of code. But obviously, that neural network is like super hard-coded architecture, so if you're using a, a real, if you were trying to solve a real problem, you would make it a little bit more abstract. So, you know, you'd be able to like 
automatically tune, you know, number of layers, that sort of stuff. Uh, and just using this like basic code, so using TensorFlow, uh, you can use that to solve uh, many, many important problems like segmentation, you know, segmenting out people in an image. Um, you can, you know, do generation as well, and you're going to talk um, about generation, I think, on Thursday. Uh, so let me recap a little bit what you have learned today. First is like just represent everything using numbers. Um, that's very useful because if everything's a number, then we know how to adjust numbers, right? So imagine the optimization process is just like you have a bunch of like, you know, tuner buttons, and you're just, you know, fiddling with them. And that's, that's what learning is all about for deep learning. Uh, you understand the layers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the tricks, here I just introduced you to like th three tricks, or there's actually many, many more tricks. And uh, that's it. This, I've, in this talk, I hope I've done a good job unpacking you know, what deep learning is, which is basically just learning hierarchies of features. And I'd like to acknowledge Marco Lorenzato, who uh, contributed a lot of figures and advice for this talk. Thank you.